Hello, and, and welcome to Stanford Computer Science course, Computational Models of the Neocortex. I started working on this lecture back in December, and I've tried it out in several audiences in preparation for this class. This time around, I'm creating a video that I will upload to my YouTube channel so students can view it in advance of our in-class discussion during the first week of classes. This lecture is meant to explore a range of topics in computational neuroscience to set the stage for the invited talks and student presentations over the rest of the quarter. The three hypotheses mentioned in the title are interesting for the way in which they illustrate the application of evidence in the brain sciences and the questions that drive research. In our class discussions, we'll talk a lot more about the weight of evidence in the various subfields of neuroscience and what constitutes an interesting or useful theory. Following a version of this talk that I gave back in January, I collaborated with two of my colleagues at, at Google to summarize the arguments in a technical report, which is available from Brown University. Greg Corrado and John Schlenz are neuroscientists and software engineers who work for me at Google. You'll meet Greg and John when they participate in a couple of our classes in which their expertise is particularly relevant. Our revised version of the technical report was accepted for publications in, in the proceedings of AAAI 2012, which will be held in Toronto in July. One problem with giving the same talk several times is that it is hard to resist the temptation to embellish and add more material. Last time I prepared for this talk, I kept coming up with organisms from which I've learned valuable lessons about the nature of biological computation. The stories associated with such organisms are the use cases that I keep in mind as I attempt to reverse engineer the brain. I admit that this slide, or the next one, um, is not central to the main topic of this lecture, but I want to make the point that we've learned a lot about human cognition by studying other animals, precisely because we share a great deal of our basic genetic machinery with these organisms. The sea cucumber starts off as a mobile life form before attaching itself to a rock and digesting its brain. Daniel Wolpert's lesson, which he delivered in his deadpan, stand-up comedy-style TED Talk last year, is that you don't need a brain if you can't interact with your environment. The nervous system of the marine worm C. elegans consists of 302 non-spiking neurons, each one of which is a highly specialized analog computer. The takeaway lesson is that this isn't a good starting point if you want to scale a brain to billions of neurons. Charles Sherrington wrote the book on muscle reflex circuits, but Eric Kandel's work on the sea slug's gill siphon reflex earned him a Nobel Prize and revealed the fundamental neural processes underlying learning. The lesson is that nature is highly conservative and that sensing, acting, and feedback are ubiquitous in the animal world. Letvin, Maturana, McCullough, and Pitts demonstrated how the periphery, the frog's eye in this case, and the frog's brain, specifically its tectum, which is the precursor to the visual cortex in mammals, share the responsibility for perception. The lesson I took away from reading their 1959 paper is that evolutionary pressure encouraged the integration of sensory modalities, thus providing an opportunity for developing a more general and centralized computational substrate. Research on the representation of information originating from the whisker pad in the right primary somatosensory cortex showed that topographic map formation, that is, neural circuits that encode relationships, often of a geometric character among pre percepts, is highly plastic. The lesson being that the machinery for building representations in primary sensory cortex is capable of rapid adjustment in response to environmental change. I promise that if you continue to study computational neuroscience, you'll encounter these five organisms more often, quite often in your readings. Now, turning to the central topic of this lecture, let me start by summarizing the three hypotheses that we will be focusing on. First, the mind is primarily composed of stable cortical circuits 
which encapsulate specific cognitive competences and exhibit modularity in terms of their not needing to refer to other modules in order to function. Two, there is one basic algorithm responsible for most, if not all, the computation occurring in the cortex. This algorithm is implemented on a computationally homogeneous neural substrate, and it runs simultaneously on many different inputs. And third, scaling the computational capacity of the cortex, perhaps by varying the scaling factor among the different functional areas, accounts for much of the major individual and collective technological and cultural progress achieved by Homo sapiens. Jerry Fodor states that modular systems must fulfill certain properties. These include domain specificity, namely that specialized modules only operate on certain kinds of inputs, and informational encapsulation that modules don't refer to other modules in order to operate. These will turn out to be too restrictive to apply to most cortical functions, and we'll end up relaxing Fodor's notion of modularity. The idea that the cortex runs many instances of the same basic algorithm, what I like to call algorithmic parsimony, seemed quite reasonable to a number of the more computationally oriented neuroscientists at a symposium held in Stanford's Clark Center in 2010. However, many of the hardcore neuroscientists in the audience protested and pointed to the work of Corbinian Broadman on the cytoarchitecture of the cortex, which we'll review in just a minute. Charles Darwin wasn't the first to posit that man and ape are more similar than different, but he and Thomas Huxley, the self-appointed intellectual bulldog were persuasive advocates of the idea. I like Robert Sapolsky's modern version, which takes the argument one step further by suggesting a specific mechanism, namely fetal neurogenesis for getting from ape to man. Fodor would probably not include reciprocity and social dominance in his list of modular functions. But evolutionary psychologists such as Lita Cosmides and John Tooby embrace a broader view of modularity in which evolutionary selection pressure acts on neural circuits that encapsulate patterns of activity. Apropos my comment regarding Broadman and the neuroscience in the, in the audience, homogeneity is in the eye of the beholder, and in this case, one of the most influential beholder, one of the most influential beholders has been Vernon Mountcastle with his theory of cortical columns, to which we will turn shortly. Sapolsky's interpretation of the gymnomic similarities between ape and man has its critics. Cognitive neuroscientist Michael Gazaniga has a very different interpretation, as does evolutionary developmental biologist Sean Carroll, both of whom we'll see in subsequent lectures. Moreover, the new data is pouring in almost every day. A paper in Nature in December 2011 describes the first large-scale data on the human transcriptome during brain development. The transcriptome characterizes not what genes we have, but rather what proteins are transcribed by which genes and when. Scientists will be analyzing this mountain of data for years to come. But for now, there's plenty of room for differing opinions about the hypotheses that we'll be talking about today. It's often a good idea to prepare your audience by providing a preview of your conclusion. It's like getting a glimpse of a completed puzzle before trying to assemble it. There are three main conclusions that I'll be arguing for in this presentation. First, structural or morphological modularity at the genomic level enables computational scaling just as modular circuit design enables computational scaling in modern computer architectures. Second, the level of granularity due to algorithmic parsimony, if such a principle can be said to apply to the cortex, is probably more than a logic gate, but how much more is open to debate. And third, 
additional stages of prenatal neurogenesis could plausibly increase the depth of combinatorial neural circuits, thus facilitating longer chains of infants and deeper recursive embedding. Since many of the ideas we explore in this talk are hotly contested and will likely be completely resolved uh, and will unlikely be completely resolved anytime soon, I'd like to start by exploring the nature of evidence in computational neuroscience. Here are two of my favorite quotes, quotes regarding theorizing and evidence. Unfortunately, refuted hypotheses don't necessarily die, even in cases where experts agree that the evidence damning them is conclusive. Even Max Planck's observation that science advances one funeral at a time is confounded by influential scientists speaking from the grave. Box's quote doesn't imply that falsified but useful theories should elevate their misguided authors so much as underscore the license afforded by ambiguously worded theories and the randomness of scientific discovery. Ultimately, what we were, are really interested in is verifiable or testable theories. Camilo Golgi believed that the processes, the axons and dendrites of neurons, are fused together to create a massive network. Ramon E. Cajal, on the other hand, believed that the nervous system is made up of discrete individual cells. Golgi and Cajal battled battle throughout their scientific careers. Their war, war of words even extended to the Nobel Prize ceremony in, in Stockholm, where the two men were honored for their contributions to neurophysiology. When given their chance at the podium, each man used the opportunity to attack the other. In the end, new brain imaging techniques confirmed the neuron theory of Cajal, but their decades-long dispute makes for interesting reading. Every discipline has its own idiosyncratic criteria for establishing the credence of competing theories, and neuroscience is no exception. Indeed, neuroscience is not one discipline, but many, and in the cases presented here, we need to consider evidence from several of these disciplines. The problem in the case of the brain is exacerbated by the fact that the evidence is scattered the old adage about the blind man, men examining an elephant comes to mind. And this evidence is open to rather broad interpretation. Each of the relevant disciplines brings a different mindset to the analysis of the data, and it is common for different data sets to give rise to very different theories. Here are some of the subfields in the brain sciences along with some of the scientists who made major contributions to our early understanding of brain function. Phineas Gage survived an accident where, when a large iron rod was driven through his skull and brain, destroying much of his brain's left frontal lobe. The physician, John Martin Harlow, tended Gage, providing a graphic account of his wounds and subsequent recovery. The account itself is allegedly exaggerated, but the basic practice of observing patients with neurological disorders still provides crucial evidence in studying the brain. Wilder Penfield is famous for his work on lateralization of function and topographic maps of the cortex, which he had obtained from awake patients during surgery. You've probably seen the drawing of the cortical homunculus. Roger Sperry and his protege, Michael Gazzaniga, are known for their experiments on split brain patients, where the corpus callosum is severed as part of a surgical intervention used in treating severe epilepsy. Richard Caton and Hans Berger are known for their pioneering work on electroencephalography and the discovery of alpha waves, which are rhythmic activations of neural ensembles. McLean's triune brain theory was featured in Carl Sagan's Dragons of Eden 
probably to Sagan's, Sagan's subsequent embarrassment when the theory was roundly discredited. This was not the first time that an easy to understand, but wrong, scientific theory was catapulted to fame by the popular press. Not a few otherwise well-educated scientists still believed some version of Maclean's theory. Ernst Haeckel contributed a great deal to evolutionary and developmental neuroscience, but ultimately his theory that the development of the individual recapitulates, recapitulates the evolution of its ancestors was not supported by detailed scrutiny of the evidence. Haeckel's detailed drawings comparing the developmental stages of embryo belonging to different species were visually compelling. Unfortunately, he ran afoul of the creationists of the time and spent much of his career defending the theory of natural selection and his personal character against the onslaught of their invective. The problem was that he took some artistic license in his renderings and got caught up in the public furor over the theory of evolution. He was convicted by the jury of public opinion long before the scientific community abandoned his theory on the basis of mounting evidence. A subsequent careful analysis of his drawings showed that while he did take some liberties, for the most part his transformations, which included aligning the embryos and eliminating or minimizing their yolk sacs, were quite reasonable. But there was a seed of a good idea in Haeckel's theory. The genes that determine the basic design of bodies and brains behave in a quite modular fashion. The homeobox is a 180 base pair sequence of DNA that has been found in all homeotic genes and also in many other regulatory genes. Homeobox containing or Hox genes are responsible for the major decisions in development rather than the fussy details uh, that are apparent in the mature organs. For example, fruit flies with a particular mutation in one of their many Hox genes will develop an anatomically normal leg in the spot where an antenna should be. Homeotic genes are almost identical in very different species. We can study homeotic genes in the fruit fly to learn about the same genes that control development in a human or mouse. These groups of genes have remained relatively unchanged throughout evolutionary history. Body plans, and also the basic plans for brains, are fundamentally modular. One might argue, unavoidably so, given the importance of getting the basic foundation right. But while structure is under modular genomic control, function remains more elusive. Franz Gall had a pretty good idea, namely that functions are localized in the brain. He just had a flawed realization of this idea. You've probably heard about phrenology, which is the practice of predicting cognitive abilities based on the bumps on your skill, on your skull. Corbinian Brodmann's division of the cortex into areas was based on the histology, the microscopic anatomy of cells, and the psychoarchitecture, the arrangement of cells within particular types of tissue. Brodmann's divisions have stood the test of time, and in many cases have been shown to identify functional divisions. Fellman and Van Essen's work provided a wiring diagram for how Brodmann areas associated with the visual pathways, including more recently identified sub-areas that preserve the boundaries of Brodmann divisions, are wired together. Fodor's idea of modularity was motivated in part by the work of Noam Chomsky, and so it is no surprise that Fodor believed language was modular. Observations of patients with cortical lesions due to stroke or other insult to brain areas implicated in language function were considered evidence in favor of modularity. Early brain imaging work seemed to lend weight to the idea of modularity in functions such as reading, writing, generating and comprehending language. As an aside, 
Stanislaw Dehaene's Reading in the Brain is an excellent book for getting a glimpse of a complex cognitive function. You might also check out the work of Brian Wandel on seeing words. You can find several recent papers on Brian's Stanford website. However, it soon became apparent that most cognitive functions do not satisfy the requirements for modularity, at least as Fodor initially spelled them out. They share inputs, they also share both cortical and subcortical circuits, and they lack functional autonomy. Even the language-related capacities do not appear to exhibit the requisite properties. More sophisticated imaging using functional magnetic resonance imaging involving many trials and a variety of subjects made it pretty clear that language, language utilized many different functional areas that serve multiple aspects of language. The exact way in which these functional areas were engaged changed depending upon the details of the task and even the subject or how he or she was primed prior to performing the task. Only in recent years have we begun to understand how simpler functional areas really communicate. Bundles of highly myelinated axons are more pronounced in adult humans than in juveniles or primates and other mammals. The myelin sheath of a Schwann cell surrounds the axon to increase the speed of action potential propagation and reduce crosstalk by insulating the axon from surrounding cells. There are other modes of information transformation that complicate our understanding of cognitive processes. These include diffuse modulatory transmitter systems, which can modify the behavior of large numbers of neurons, and neural oscillations, which create rhythmic patterns of firings among collections of neurons to coordinate computation. In summary, structural modularity at the court at the circuit level seems plausible, but functional modularity, at least with respect to the higher level cognitive functions, does not appear to satisfy an engineer's or an architecture architect's notion of modularity. Now we'll turn turn to our second hypothesis, namely the idea that there is a single algorithm that's running on the neural substrate. The variation in histology that Broadman used to divide the cortex into areas is perhaps the most obvious argument against there being a uniform substrate. However, there is some evidence that despite these cell level architectural differences, the basic operation performed in the primary sensory areas is the same. The question is, what is the general algorithm and does it apply to areas other than those associated with our primary sensory apparatus? We'll introduce some terminology that will prove useful in the rest of this talk, but also in our conversations throughout the rest of the quarter. Many, but certainly not all, neuroscientists view the cortex as a collection of anatomically if not functionally distinct structures referred to as cortical columns. Each hypercolumn, a bundle of smaller columnar structures, consists of approximately 60,000 cells and a thousand times that many connections, most of which span no more than a couple of millimeters. The cells within columns are, are themselves organized in several layers, and the hypercolumns are grouped into larger functionally related cortical areas. In the retina, collections of light-sensitive cells called rods and cones are connected to amacrine and bipolar neurons also residing within the retina. The amacrine and bipolar cells map to retinal ganglion cell bodies in the eye whose axonal processes extend along pathways leading from the eye through the lateral geniculate nuclei and on into the striate cortex. The light-sensitive region of the retina, which serves to stimulate a given neuron, either directly or indirectly, through intermediate cells, 
is called the neuron's receptive field. These connections define so-called retinotopic mappings that preserve locality so that spatial relationships are maintained as information is transmitted along the visual pathways. More generally, topographical maps are quite common in the primate cortex, encoding and preserving a wide variety of similarity measures often referred to as invariants. Normally in mammals, the retinal input from the right visual field is routed, routed to the lateral geniculate nucleus, or LGN, of the thalamus in the left hemisphere and to the superior colliculus. In the so-called ferret rewiring experiments reported by, by von Melchner, the connections to the superior colliculus are rerouted to the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, MGM in the diagram above, which serves a function similar to the LGN but for auditory stimuli. The superior collic colliculus is then ablated and the normal input to the MGN from the auditory tract via the inferior colliculus is severed. Not only is the ferret able to perform visual tasks using its auditory cortex, but the auditory cortex develops a retinotopic map similar to that found in a normally functioning ferret visual cortex. Topographic maps are created and maintained by several processes, some of which occur during prenatal development and some during early childhood. There are even different mechanisms used at different times and in different areas. Chemical gradient following axonal processes are perhaps the best understood, but there is also evidence that the developing fetal retina produces correlated signals that are used to organize topographic maps in several visual areas. The research on topographic maps in the somatosensory rat cortex has shown that these maps are highly dynamic and can very quickly adapt to changes in the rat peripheral nervous sensory neurons. In experiments conducted by Nicolaelis and his colleagues, the somatosensory cortex quickly adapted to accommodate the loss of sensation resulting from anesthetizing small patches of the rat facial whisker pad. It should be clear that this single algorithm, if it exists, is complicated. If you include development in the picture, then it is even more complicated. When you add what we know about how the brain changes during childhood, adolescence, and even well on into early adulthood, the potential for algorithmic complexity is dramatically compounded. And in this short introduction, we've only looked at primary sensory cortex. Algorithmic extensions to encompass motor cortex and executive function and prefrontal cortex are yet more speculative. Now we're going to turn to our final hypothesis, that somehow the quantity of neurons in the cortex is what makes the biggest difference between us and the apes. It's certainly not just quantity that matters. The genetic machinery governing the development of the brain is designed to scale and adapt to the changing cellular environment. Stretching metaphorically somewhat, we can use some analogies from computer architecture to explore the relationship between the number of basic computing units and the complexity and modularity of the overall computing architecture. Measuring brain size is complicated and fraught with controversy, but it is pretty clear that primates have larger, more complicated brains relative to their body size. The differences are even more pronounced if we focus on the cortex. Sapolsky's claim that humans have three times the number of neurons as the great apes is somewhat controversial. However, if we assume he was, refer was referring to the cerebral cortex, 
and you believe Christoph Koch's estimate, then a factor of three seems about right. Aside from the number of neurons, human cortex is more similar than different from other mammals and great apes in particular. In the earlier reference technical report, we examined the evidence in an attempt to support this claim, but treat it as a working assumption for the remainder of this talk. Right now I want to examine the claim that size matters. Transistor count is used as a very rough proxy for performance in computer engineering. What is most interesting, however, is not how many transistors you can put in a chip, but how hardware engineers can scale their designs to make use of all these transistors. By the way, I'm not implying that neurons and transistors are even roughly comparable in complexity or computational capability. The key is that processor designs are modular. Register banks, arithmetic logic units, caches, SIMD lanes, all of these scale. More is generally better. Though it must be admitted that we have some way to go in figuring out how to write code or build compilers that make the most of multi-core hardware. Let's take this computer analogy a step or two further. Nature can't afford to completely rewrite genetic code, but it is very good at reusing and repurposing existing code. It is easier to replicate structures than try to implement stacks and queues in software. The analogy of adding registers and computing cores speaks to nature's often exercised option of replicating structure. It is during field development that such a strategy is carried out under genomic control. Scaling is fundamental in development. Gastrulation occurs early in embryonic development in most animals, during which the single-layered blastula is reorganized into a three-layered structure known as the gastrula. These three germ layers are known as the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, and their early structures are remarkably similar in all mammals. The ectoderm will eventually develop into a mammalian brain. Gastrulation looks much the same in most animals, at least in this regard, Ernst Haeckel was on the right track. Cortical neurogenesis can be divided into an early and a late period. The length of time and number of cell cycles spent in the early period of cell division will ultimately determine the number of cortical columns that will be found in any given species. The length of time and the number of cell cycles spent in the later period is believed to determine the number of individual neurons within a cortical column. A higher number of early divisions will result in a larger cortical sheet. A higher number of later divisions will result in a higher number of neurons within an individual column. This developmental dance is mediated by complex genomic programs. These programs explore the developing neural tissues, differentiate cells based on ambient proteomic signals, and, as illustrated here, create cellular scaffolding that serves to precisely position cells in both the intermediate and final neural substrate. These programs also produce chemical gradient fields that guide cells and program them to differentiate themselves as appropriate to the tissues they will ultimately become. In some cases, they generate test signals, for example, in the prenatal ret retina, that are propagated along developmental axonal processes and used to organize cortical cells so as to preserve the topographic structure of distant cells in both the central and peripheral nervous systems. Here we see some stages in the development of the layers of specialized cells that make up the cortical plate. Recall from introductory biology how within the cell nucleus, single-strand template DNA is transcribed to make messenger RNA, or mRNA, which is small enough to exit the nucleus.
the mRNA is then translated by ribosomes residing outside of the nucleus to build proteins from amino acids. Regulation occurs in several steps during gene expression, during transcription, RNA processing, RNA transport, and during translation. The regulatory programs that control cortical development are extraordinarily complex, using the full repertoire of chemical and genomic signaling machineries available to the cell. Moreover, these programs have to be adapted. They employ feedback to fine-tune the neural, su neural structures in order to accommodate variations in the genome and in the change in changing proteomic environment that the development developing organism finds itself. The incredible diversity of organisms that we find in nature depends on special, specialized regulatory programs implementing modular body plans. These programs use components with standardized coding and regulatory regions and switches that behave like the conditional statements in computer programs to control gene expression using combinatorial logic. There are also post-transcriptional factors controlling the expression of RNA prior to translation that further complicate and extend the power of programs of these programs that nature uses to build bodies and brains. We'll spend a bit of time in class during discussion on these last four slides. For now, I'll just quickly summarize them. This first slide is just a long-winded way of saying we have modular brains, but not necessarily modular cognitive functions. This slide basically says that the primary sensory areas are good candidates for algorithmic simplification. But I and others are skeptical about what's going on in the deep association areas and in the cortical areas responsible for planning and controlling movement, communicating, imitating, and decision-making. I believe that the human genome is capable of scaling the cortex to provide a quantum increase in computational power. And I think this advantage just might have been able to lift us from the jungle to the city. This assertion is based on the following algorithmic assumptions. In general, a deeper stack, whether realized in software or by replicating cortical structures, allows for deeper, deeper procedural nesting and richer representations. The larger your memory and the more powerful your ability to make fine distinctions and infer complex relationships, the larger your social circle and the more subtle the laws that govern its behavior. Better means of transferring knowledge by acting to encourage mimicry and communicating to convey abstract ideas augment a society's ability to govern itself and create and share technology. In short, I believe that more computation in the form of deeper combinatorial circuits could propel, propel a species to civilization if it starts out with a sufficiently broad repertoire of basic physical and social behavior. That's it for the formal presentation. If you want to explore further, I suggest that you grab the technical report from the Brown website mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. You might also check out some of the additional materials on the class webpage. In particular, you'll find links to Robert Sapolsky's talk at the California Academy of Sciences in February 2011 and Michael Gazzaniga's Gifford lectures, which were given at Edinburgh University in 2009. The former includes Sapolsky's version of the quantity suffices hypothesis, and the latter provides an excellent survey of split brain patient studies. Thanks for your attention. I hope you found this presentational educational.